Okay, I think we're recording now. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the August meeting of the UI Interest Group. I am excited for today's talk because this is something I struggled with a lot um, when I started with Evergreen. Um, let me post into the chat our agenda. Okay, and then I'm probably not going to look at chat uh, again if someone calls my attention to it because I have one window and too many things to look at. Um, so let me run through these first few like standing items on our agenda. Hello, this is our new meeting time that we've had for a couple of months now. I hope it's working out well for folks. Um, if this time is bad, we can discuss moving it, but um, we seem to have a pretty good group. Um, some updates. Uh, we have not had a whole lot of changes to the wiki in the last month, except that I completely finished um, copying the accessibility guide from the Google Doc. And so that is now in there. And now I can see where things are a bit terse and too short. And so I will be going back and adding things. But of course, this is the wiki now. So feel free to add things yourself. Um, and if there's something that you want to see in there, but you don't know what it should be, just drop me a note and I will put that on the list of things to add. Um, also not a lot of updates on our project to um, find ourselves a fancy spreadsheet service to use for our various renaming and tagging projects, but um, Based on our last conversation, I think we're going to try monday.com. And I think we have few enough people that we can try their free um, free plan for a little while. So if you are interested in taking part in any of those renaming projects and you haven't yet added yourself to the spreadsheet, please do that. It is linked there in the agenda. Um, it was originally the Airtable sheet, but I renamed it since we might not go with Airtable. Um, anything else before we get started on talking about where to find files? No? Okay. We'll come back at the end and talk about bugs and bug squashing and all of that good stuff, but I want to make sure we get to this. Let me... my screen share. Okay. And everybody see some gray slides that say finding HTML and CSS files. Yeah, good. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So this question came up last time. Um, where the heck do we find the HTML and CSS files that we need to do to make changes to the UI? And the answer is there are six different places at least. Um, and, and one of those is like a rabbit hole of additional places. Um, so it very much depends on what you're looking at. And I'm going to start with the OPAC. And this part I'm going to say, please shout out if you see me get something wrong here because I work so little with the OPAC um, that I got my colleagues to sanity check this presentation to make sure I was listing the right files because I don't work with these much. Um, so there's two versions of the OPAC, depending on how old your installation is and whether or not you ever changed from the really old version. The newer one is based on Bootstrap 4. Um, we all call it the BooPack. Um, its files are in the templates-bootstrap folder. The CSS file is not a .css file. It is a .css.tt2 file because Template Toolkit is awesome and puts its own file extension on things. And this really makes it difficult to use your correct syntax highlighting in your development environment. So love Template Toolkit for that. Thanks, guys. It's awesome. Um, and it makes the, the file a little hard to find. But it is CSS. It just gets compiled. Um, so that's there. 
And then there is a whole folder of JavaScript files. Um, and there's there's more than that, but you will see like the, the main one there and then it pulls a bunch of other stuff in. And the CSS file too also has some includes at the top where it reaches for some other things. The older version of the OPAC looks very similar. It's just in templates rather than templates dash bootstrap. Um, and it does the same things. It's got the template toolkit files, some common JavaScript files, things like that. And then there's the kids OPAC. This pains me that it is based on Bootstrap 3 because that version of Bootstrap has a lot of accessibility problems and I have not gone through the kids interface, but I can make a good guess at what the issues are going to be there. Um, so it has the templates-kpac folder rather than templates-opac. Uh, it's got a skin, which I have not looked at too closely, but um, I know it pulls in some fonts that the opac doesn't and some other things. And then those main JavaScript files pull in a bunch of other ones. So Galen gave me this partial list of things that you probably want to look at if the OPEC um, is what you are interested in customizing. There is also, as I said, the CSS file pulls in some additional things. And um, Eva just filed a bug this morning on colors and how there is supposed to be a dedicated file for colors so that you can brand your OPEC correctly. and as inevitably happens, we have gotten some stray color definitions stuck into other files, and we need to pull those back um, and consolidate so that people can brand their stuff correctly. So that is a brand new bug filed this morning, and it's uh, lengthy. It's got a good explanation of what's going on. You can go check that out. Galen has some tips about customizing the OPAC and um, overriding the CSS. I will leave that here for your delectation. I feel like we could do a whole session just on customizing the OPAC and then probably a second one on customizing the OPAC in an accessible way. Um, but I wanna move on and talk about the staff interface because I know that was the question that came up last month. Before we go on to staff, does anybody have questions about where to find the OPAC files? And I'm not looking at chat right now, so shout them out. There isn't anything in chat, so. Thank you, Andrea, I appreciate that. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Oh, the staff interface. Which one is the question? <laughs> there are a couple of bits of the oldest web interfaces hanging around in Dojo. I think it's just reports and a couple pieces of acquisitions like uh, invoices, is that correct? In, in 3.11, that's all we have left? I'm pretty sure there's one or two admin couple. interfaces still too. A couple more? Ugh. Well, okay. there's Link Checker and oh, OU Link Trees, Checker. both of which we have recently finished in our pending community branches. Yeah. Yeah. But they're still there for now. So yes, as of 311, that is correct. I will update this slide. So we have a few hang a few bits and pieces hanging around. Um oh where'd my slide go on Oh, the, sorry, let me go back to Dojo. <laughs> if for some reason you want to make changes to Dojo, which I wouldn't recommend because we're about to replace all of those. Um, I think the file references are in that link there, which goes to the wiki page. All right. Slightly less old AngularJS. Um, we have still several pieces of the interface that are in the older version of the Angular framework, which is called Angular JS because Google doesn't like people. Um, and so the fastest way to tell which one you're looking at is to look at your URL. If you see eg slash staff, you're in Angular JS. If you see eg2 slash some language locale slash staff, then you're in Angular, which is the newer one. Um, Again, a partial list of things that are still in Angular JS in 3.11, circulation, the 
not the experimental new one, but the older circulation. Um, workstation admin, I think some several parts of acquisitions, probably some more things I'm not thinking of right now. Handful of other admin interfaces. Yeah. C3950. Oh God, Z3950. Yep. So these files uh, are in templates slash staff, and this is template toolkit stuff. So it works very similarly to the way the OPAC works. And the style sheet, again, has the template toolkit file extension. So it doesn't look like a CSS file until you teach your IDE what to do with those. Um, and the JavaScript files are in JS UI default staff. And again, those pull in lots of other things. So if you just kind of look through that directory, you will find all the, the bits and pieces that you need to find. One thing I did not go into in, in this presentation and I want to come back to at a future date is talking about how the different frameworks handle translation and all the different places we have translated strings stashed. <laughs> some of them are in the files, some of them are in the templates, some of them are in the admin interface. It's some of them are in the IDL. It's great. Um, but the template toolkit interfaces handle string translation very differently than the Angular ones. So that's something to watch out for as you go through those files. And finally, beloved Angular, our newer interfaces that we are slowly getting everything into. If you see a language code in your URL, you are looking at Angular. These um, have uh, Usually for almost every component, you will see three, at least three files, HTML, CSS, and TS TypeScript. And those all live in a little bundle together throughout the hierarchy of things that all lives under the EG2 slash SRC slash app folder. And there is one parent style sheet, styles.css, that imposes itself on everything. And then each component underneath Angular has its own little bundle of CSS things. Some quirks about Angular. <sighs> As of 3.11, we are now on Angular version 15, Bootstrap 5.2 for the CSS files. And then for the interactive bits of Bootstrap, we have the ng Bootstrap library on version 14. When you change your HTML and CSS and JavaScript files, you have to run ng-build before you will see those changes reflected in the browser, which is really frustrating <laughs> and very slow. Um, I'm told that Angular 16 is faster at building. I really want that because I spend about half my time waiting for Angular to rebuild. Um, another thing that Angular does is it uses Webpack to compress all the little loose JavaScript and CSS files into consolidated um, files. And that makes it a little bit more difficult to debug. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And then the other challenge working with Angular files, not only is just finding the files, but then figuring out the encapsulation issues. So first challenge, Webpack. Uh, Webpack is building one big file or or a couple of small files out of all of the stuff that we pull in from other libraries, primarily Bootstrap, but also all of the other bits of JavaScript and things that are from other open source packages that we want to use. Um, and this makes it a little difficult to figure out where things are happening. You get like one big vendor.js file and you're like, what the heck is going on? You can see which pieces Webpack is pulling in by looking at the config file. And I've given the URL there. The other thing that makes it challenging to debug what's going on in Angular is view encapsulation. And so, okay. Every component that we add, like I said, has its own little trio of files. And sometimes there might be an extra one if there's unit tests. Um, and there might be a fifth one if there's a module as well as a component. It's all kind of complicated. I think it's overly complicated. Um, but there will be usually at least three. Uh, and there will be a selector 
in the TypeScript file that tells you what you're looking for. A lot of times it's a custom HTML element like I've shown here with ETTree. Sometimes it's a class name. Sometimes it's an attribute that goes on some other HTML tag. So that's why it's called selector and not element in the component definition. But what Angular does when you create a component and you give it a selector, let's say we're creating a new element like ETTree, it will slap a host definition on it. And this is randomized. We cannot predict what comes after ng host dash. It depends on what other stuff is on the page. This is all privately generated and we can't really grab it and do anything with it in our code. It just gets added. The ng host attribute goes on the parent selector for whatever component we're working with. And then every HTML element beneath that in the DOM tree gets an ng content attribute where the last half is that random string that matches the ng host. So in this case, it would be ng content dash ALN dash C80. And again, there's this, this is like a private API that Angular uses, and it doesn't give us a way to find out what that ID is. So we're just flying blind and letting it add that to our code, and it just does its thing. When we build our code, it puts these attributes in the HTML, and then it adds them as type selectors to our CSS rules. And if you have a compound CSS selector, it will add it to each part, which is really dumb. <laughs> so it's not doing this in a smart way, unfortunately. So let's say you write some fairly simple HTML. Um, I, I massively simplified what's going on in um, the newest version y'all haven't seen yet of EGTree. And this is a very simple, unordered list with one list item containing a material icon button and a link. That's it. There's some classes in here, there's some aria in here, but this is fairly simple HTML. When we build it, what Angular spits out is this. So you can see it added the ng host, it added both ng content and ng host. And I'll talk about that in a second. But let's let's forget 81 for a second and talk only about 80. So it added ng host ALN C80 to the top level element of this component. And then it added that ng content, the matching attribute to everything below it. We wrote a very simple HTML or a very simple CSS rule looking like this, basic selectors, nothing fancy. Angular turned it into this. So what it's trying to do is prevent you from accidentally writing a rule somewhere 12 components down in your DOM tree that will bubble back up and affect your entire page. So let's say you know, you've know you got a form that's nested in a tree that's nested in a grid. Horrible plan. Don't ever do that. But you could do it. Um, if you wrote a heading style down in that like 12th component down, if they didn't encapsulate it, it would potentially apply back up the entire tree um, and affect your entire page. So they want to prevent you from doing that. The bad part about that is that it prevents components from knowing their context. Um, so I am personally convinced that the people at Google who created Angular just did not like their front end developers and did not want to work with them. And so they frameworked their way out of it. And rather than like using the cascade in CSS, they did this. And it's a little bit problematic because you get down into a component and it, it matters whether you're in a grid or not in a grid or in a tree or not in a tree, but Angular doesn't want you to know that. Uh, so the idea is to isolate things and give things their own style so that they're consistent when you reuse a component across multiple parts of an application, no matter which depth you're using it in an application. But that means that everything lives in isolation and doesn't know about its context and can be very difficult to work with. It is possible to turn off encapsulation. And this is how you do it. This is a screenshot from the Angular docs. I have done this uh, in a couple of places. 
I wanted to caution everyone um, about this in that when you use it in the middle of your DOM stack, it can create unexpected things happening in the stuff below it. So this is good to use when you're pretty sure that you are at the most granular level of your page and that you're never going to have another component inside the thing that you're working with. Um, so you have um, a fairly atomic piece of the interface. It's fairly safe to turn off encapsulation if it's causing you problems. Um, if you are somewhere in the middle and using like one of the big layout components like tree or grid or something like that, you probably would not want to encapsulate or you probably would not want to turn off encapsulation on those. Does that make sense? <sighs> so NG Bootstrap has its own components that sit alongside our custom evergreen components. And in theory, they're not encapsulated. But I have found that it is sometimes difficult, nevertheless, to work with their CSS because it's just really hard to target the thing that you're trying to, to get to in the bootstrap components. And if you are trying to make changes to the way that some of the stock components look, you need to do it in the main styles.css file or your part of, or the, the evergreen part of the components that you're working with because you can't change the stuff in node modules, which is where the bootstrap CSS files live, because that part gets rewritten every time we do um, uh, an NPM install or an upgrade or things like that. Um, so we want to make sure that those files stay matching whatever stock uh, library we're working with um, and we don't make changes there. So finding things in the inspectors can be really challenging because of all of this, um, these added attributes and um, the sort of the crazy depth of um, components that we sometimes get in some of our more complicated interfaces where we're calling custom thing after thing after thing and it just gets like really deep. So the simplest way to find the thing uh, that you're looking at is to use your um, browser developer tools, right click the thing, hit inspect and see what you're looking at. Are you looking at um, a form field? Go up the tree of its parent HTML elements until you see something that looks like it might be a custom HTML element. Um, it's not standard HTML5. Uh, most of the evergreen components start with eg dash something. Uh, some of them don't. Um, there's a couple of them. And I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Er, no, brain empty, blue screen. Can't remember. There, are, I know I've come across a couple of them that are not prefixed with EG, but most of them are. Um, and then, so figuring out what that custom HTML element is, is your first step. And then you pop over to your um, VS code or Vim or whatever, and just search the files for that string. Look for a TypeScript file that says selector this thing. Um, so it'll say like selector colon eg dash grid. That's where the, the grid is defined. Um, and from there, you'll see that it's probably calling multiple components after that. Like in, in grid, we have one major grid component. And then like the header row is its own component and the filter row is its own component. And then each like data row is a component and within the row, each cell is its own component. So that one, we have like multiple nested components happening in one big um, part of the interface. There is an Angular inspector for Chrome. It only works with Chrome, unfortunately. Um, and I find it really hit or miss. Um, sometimes it just will not load. And sometimes it will load, but then the, its little inspector arrow doesn't work. Um, when it works, it works just like the regular developer tool inspector. You hit your little arrow, you move around the interface, you click the thing you're interested in, and it will give you 
an angular inspector and it will tell you which component you're looking at, where it came from, um, what the data objects being passed to it look like. It's really helpful. I just find that it, it crashes a lot and just doesn't work. But when it does, it's great. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Does anybody have any questions? Did that answer anybody's questions about where to find things? That was extremely helpful for me. Awesome. Does anybody want to do a little live test and see if we can figure out where some files are? Sure. All right. Who's got something they want to inspect and and find? Grid is always fun. We can look at a grid, but um, what else is fun? Uh, Simple Reporter has some interesting components. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing custom OU trees until we get the new version out. That one is messy. Um, what else is interesting? Uh, actually, anything in the sandbox we could look at. And I will, let me open up a new evergreen window and I will pull up um, Let me pull up one of the bug squashing servers and take a look at that. Do, 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 do. One moment when I finish logging in. Okay, great. Share my screen again. Shoot, I should have done Chrome. I'm in Firefox, so I'm not going to show you the Angular inspector just yet. I will switch in a second. Um, okay. Let me go to, oops. Great. Has everyone seen the sandbox before? Is this new to anyone? The sandbox is a new to me. <laughs> the sandbox is a really random assortment of UI components. And um I think I filed a bug not that long ago about separating these because it is really hard. In when everything is in one file to sort of trace the different data objects that are coming into these things. But right now they're all thrown together in one place. Um, so you can see how the different combo boxes look and then the different progress bars and things like this. Um, I will say this has not gotten a complete overhaul for accessibility yet. So um, when you grab a component from here, maybe take a look at at uh, Launchpad and see if there's some improvements that have been suggested and not quite yet uh, made it into the code yet. But let's look at... Stephanie, what, can yeah. you paste... What's the uh, path to the sandbox again? Uh, it is staff slash sandbox okay. after oh, your local. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like template driven forms? I love this. This is such a mess. Um, okay. Here's a simple one. Simple combo box. Sure. <laughs> combo box is anything but simple. Uh, I have been fighting with it for the last couple of weeks, but I happen to know uh I happen to know where this one is. Okay. 
So I'm on an input. Great. That's probably part of something else. Let's go up. Aha, uh, uh -huh. you do combo box. There we go. So that's what I want to look at. Um, so I happen to know that this one is in, um, I think it's staff share uh, in the file hierarchy of the app. So let me pop over. I'm going to go into open ILS slash SRC slash EG2 slash SRC again, which I find really confusing. And then slash app. Okay, here we go. Core, share, and staff. These are very useful folders to know. Share is where a lot of our generic UI um, things live. And there's combo box. So um, let me switch my screen share to show you my development. Um, I'm just going to share my whole screen and then minimize y'all real quick. Okay. Okay, great. So I'm in VS Code. Over here, I've got Open ILS. And then, whoops, let me stop doing that. SRC, EG2, SRC, app, share. And then here's combo box. So I'm going to hover over that for, for a second so that you get the tooltip giving you the path there. Now, what I would do if I didn't know where that was um, is I would, first of all, move my little Zoom thingy and go up to the VS Code um, search thing. And I would just type, whoops, EG combo box. And if I type it correctly, Okay. There we go. So if you search the files, you'll find here's my HTML file. Um, oh, it's because I'm I'm buried. I'm only searching the Mark Edit folder. Hold on. There we go. So VS Code is really good about figuring out and almost always showing you first the um, selector file. So in this case, combo box does have a child component, um, combo box dash entry. And that is the component that controls each um, like search result in the, the combo box suggestions. So each one of those is its own component. Um, and then those get fed into the combo box component. So here's EG combo box. That's the selector we're looking for. So that's the file we want. And then here is, yep, that's where we, we find everything. So that gives us the location of the HTML file. In this case, it doesn't have a CSS file. It just has a few styles provided directly here in the TypeScript. And then, oh, hey, it gives us some information about some data providers. So that is how I do that. Um, let's look at, look at something else that would be interesting. Oh, the FM editor. Yes, the field mapper editor is a fun one. So. This is an input. Let me go up. Form row. Here's a form. I'm in a modal. OK, so modal is interesting um, because it is there is a modal component, but it's usually buried in something else. So I'm going to go up one past that. And yep, there I go. EG FM record editor. There's my field mapper editor component. I'm going to copy that, go back to VS Code. I'm going to type this into the search. And yep, there it is. Ah, but this is another one that has a child component on it. So it gave me the child first, FM editor action. And I actually want this second one here. 
that where the selector actually matches exactly what I typed in. All right, and then if I go here, I can find the HTML that's associated with this. Uh, again, this one doesn't have a style sheet. And I think reveal and explore review. Yeah, there we go. So then I can find that in the hierarchy a little bit easier. And it lives right alongside combo box in app slash share. All right, stop sharing for a second. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any pieces that they want to look at and trace back to their source? Um, the thing to look for when you find a component um, is uh, like scroll down a little bit past the the template um, and CSS definitions and see if you see any view child um, lines or um, what's the other one that can sometimes come up. Usually, view child will kind of tell you. Uh, that might tell you if there are uh, child components that you need to look at. But you can also tell in, in the browser inspector by kind of, instead of going up, going a little further down, and you'll see those custom components come up. Like, um, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes they are... Um, attributes that get um, added to like an ng-container element, which is like a fake element that gets stripped out of the HTML. Um, sometimes they are like classes or attributes that get added to standard HTML elements, although that's not as common. Um, but usually you'll see those custom HTML elements cropping up all over the place. And that will tell you where your what your component is doing. All right. Hope that helps. It helped me to go find all those CSS files because I don't work with, like I said, the, the OPAC and the AngularJS files all that much. So now I have them in one place and I can go back and add those to the wiki. Um, although if someone beats me to it in the next week or so before I get back from vacation, feel free. Um, I have links there to the reference pages that we have in the new devs namespace uh, on all three of those different staff interfaces, um, as well as the OPAC. And I think that the uh, HTML template files and the JavaScript paths are listed, but I think the CSS paths were missing. Um, so we'll go back and add those. But in the meantime, you've got them all here in the slides. And I think that's it, unless anyone has questions about that. We move on to looking at some bugs and some other stuff. Um, so Bug Squashing Week is happening right now, as I'm sure you've all seen. Thanks to Taryn, as always, for organizing that. It is amazing. Thank um, you to all of you who have been testing. It's great. Uh, there I put in um, that bug from Eva about the colors in the OPAC, and then Josh Strompro has been doing a bunch of work on um, keyboard shortcuts for the Mark editor. And rather than list them all here, because he's got like half a dozen of them, um, I just tagged them all as UX-keyboard um, and put a link to that tag. So um, I'm trying to catch those as they come in. I have not had time to look closely at them this week. I checked them to make sure he wasn't um, conflicting with uh, like standard keyboard um, shortcuts for screen readers. And I didn't see any conflicts, so I think we're okay on those. Um, but I just, like I said, flailing like a fireball through this week. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, we know that we have Hackaway coming up. Uh, quick update on 
the VPAT situation with the board. Um, we talked about the quotes that had come in at the last meeting, and then I had to run off to another meeting and didn't see what the outcome was, but I believe they had picked a vendor to go with. Uh, and so we should have that coming up soon. Is that, uh, anyone have corrections or updates on that? Yes, we're going with CD, that's what I thought. Okay, um, so CD is great. They have done some accessibility reviews of parts of the Evergreen interface before. Their quote was very reasonable. Um, and they quoted only and exactly the work that we had asked for rather than like what we asked for plus a bunch of consulting hours, which is kind of what everyone else came back and, and wanted to do. Um, so we will have that coming up. It's probably not going to be a very flattering report, but it will give us a list of accessibility issues that we need to work through. And I think they're only, yeah, they're only going to do the OPAC. Yeah. Yeah, and I I'm pretty sure both us and Pines have commissioned CD reports on various parts of Evergreen. And no, they're not flattering, but they yeah, are very helpful. Are very to helpful. to be fair, a lot of the ones that we reported on our initial um, when we initially did that have been fixed. Not all of them, but a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, and and I've been working through, uh, as you all have seen in the last several months, I've been working through a list of those as well. So. We will get one for the OPAC and we will work through the bugs that we need to work on. Um, last, go ahead. Someone had something? That was just a blip of sound on my part. Okay. Uh, we have been talking in some of our previous meetings about cleaning up our error messages and changing some simple report field names. And um, those are the projects that we kind of want the fancy spreadsheet services so that we can work on them a little bit better. I also just need to get some ducks in a row um, to get all of that together. And I will work on that when I get back from vacation uh, in September. Um, but the, the at the last meeting, we, we, we kind of went briefly over this, but I wanted to kind of pause and say, um, we had talked about the fact that we probably ought to have at least the basics of our editorial style guidelines in place before we tackle those renaming and, and relabeling projects, which is a very good idea. Um, and so I will suggest that we do that for our next meeting in September, unless someone has another burning topic that they want to bring up. Um, and then we can get that in place. And if we can get um, uh, like an outline hammered out in September, then that's something that we can uh, iterate on during the Hackaway, perhaps. Sound good? Um, I did want to say on the uh, air code spreadsheet, I think you have it linked at the bottom in the homework. I started a tab for message variations. I didn't get too far, but it does give a pretty good view of how many different variations there are, even for, you know, success or fail. Um, so I, and I don't know if that's the best way to put that information. I just put the um, event code with the message I got, and then I started adding when that happened. So I, whether it was, you know, a certain interface or something, um, the again did not get very far. Um, and I'm open to suggestions about how to continue to add those as I come across. That's fantastic, Susan. Thank you for doing that. I think that what you're doing is probably the best way until we can put this into a, a linked um, table of some sort. And so I will try to get cracking on um, getting all of our stuff moved from the very temporary Airtable account that I had set up uh, and see if we can get moving on monday.com sometime in the next month or so. Um, then we can continue to work on that. That would be amazing. Um, I put in a link to the um, kind of proposed new style for uh, like sort of normal, uh, normal buttons that aren't like the primary action of the page. Uh, like cancel buttons or just like a like a secondary action. Um, so this is filed under the bug called stop using yellow buttons for normal operations. 
yellow is kind of a, an emergency alert color and it puts some people on edge and we don't need to be using it um, as much as we are. So what I'm proposing is two different styles that initially look the same. They're just normal like gray buttons. Um, but the one that can be destructive and delete things turns red when you hover over it and when you click it. Um, and the, the other one doesn't. So I think that will calm things down quite a bit. Um, and what I'm planning to do is to come back to this bug and add a couple of examples of how this would work, like uh, on modals, uh, for one thing, and maybe something else like a serials page or something that has like 12 yellow buttons on it. Um, so we can kind of see how this would look uh, in the wild. But I wanted to get your opinions on that bug. Um, so feel free to add thoughts, feedback, criticisms over on there on Launchpad. Um, I keep losing my window. There we go. Um, we have a couple of new bugs. I mentioned those already. Um, this list of older bugs that need feedback is the same as last month. We have nothing new added there. I'm going to add editorial style guide outline as our um, probable topic for September. Does anybody want to add other future topics for us to put on the list? Um, we could throw in OPAC customization for a future uh, topic. Anything else? I think you, or someone mentioned this in a previous meeting, um, but testing accessibility bugs. Yes. Uh, yeah, even though list. Um, yes. This, I'm not really sure <laughs> what to look at. Um, and I yes. know you do note in some, but yeah, that would be helpful for ignorant people like me who <laughs> don't know how to do, what to look for. I really would like to do a Hackaway session on that. And so uh, why don't we do, um, editorial style in September and then uh, the overview of accessibility testing at Hackaway, if that's okay with y'all. That sound... We weren't able there... to convince Susan to come with us to the Hackaway this year, unfortunately. But... Well, I think I still may have a conflicting trip, but I was like, if you can, um, you know, I can log on. And just yeah, we'll, the room just so we'll do it on Zoom. Room. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> there is a page on basic accessibility testing in the accessibility guide. Um, and the the five minute version is run Axe Dev Tools and see what it reports. Or if you're in Chrome, you can do this in Lighthouse because it has Axe Dev Tools built in. Um, and so it uses the same same algorithm to score things. That will give you all of the automated stuff, like you know your images are missing their alt tags, or your are your roles are wrong, or um, you've got click actions on something other than a button tag, or you know the basics. Um, it'll give you those. And then the other thing to do is to turn on keyboard uh, navigation in your browser. It's almost never on by default, so you have to find your settings and like enable the thing where you can tab through. Um, all the elements on the page. And there's instructions on how to do it in Safari and Chrome and um, Firefox um, in the guide. Um, and then you just start with your URL highlighted and start pressing the tab key. And you'll just go sequentially through the page. And you will see, um, you're like, okay, I just hit tab and my focus disappeared. What happened? And that's like something was missing its focus or, um, there was like maybe an element that was hidden for some reason that was still interactive. And that will tell you like where those, those keyboard navigation problems are. And so when you land on something like a drop down, then you press either enter or space um, and see if you can activate it. Um, and so if you're like on a navigation menu and you're on one of those top levels, you hit the space bar and it should drop down the sub menu. And then you should be able to use your arrow keys and move around. And if you can't, there's your problem. Um, and so, just those two things, running Axe Dev Tools and then tabbing through using your keyboard, will reveal a world of accessibility issues. Thank you. Yeah.
All right. I have been talking for a long time. Does anyone else have anything they want to talk about in our last few minutes? All right, I will turn you all loose. I will try to get us set up. Oh, Elizabeth, you had something? I just wanted to wish you a happy vacation, but remind you to please come back. I will. I will. Yes, this will be my first vacation uh, in like five years, honestly. Wow. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. I did grad school during the pandemic, which was a really, really <laughs> bad idea. Um, so, haven't gone anywhere in a while. Oh, Andrew, you know I'm going to check my work email, but uh, <laughs> I will probably not respond um other than like I, I will I can get Gail to lock you out you know you totally can um I will come and heckle you on Slack um <laughs> we can we can we can boot you from that too temporarily this is all for your own good <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you all I hope you have a great week month rest of the summer uh for some of you who haven't had your kids go back to school yet like I have uh, I will see you in about a month. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you.